Okay, uh, Stephen and Phil back here with uh, another edition of, and I often get the title wrong, so let me get it right, What They Said. I think I always call it What They Saw, but it's What They yep. Said after the Pauline Kael documentary, What She Said. And uh, tonight, um, as always, we're playing catch up with uh, films from, you know, we're into April, but we're catching up with films from last year. Some of these at least one of which I saw just yesterday, some, a couple probably to go back weeks for us. Um, when we picked the films for tonight, I was thinking, Stephen, that uh, I think we picked them basically based on access, cheap access. You know, what we could see, what we could stream either for free or fairly cheaply. And yet yeah. it's a perfect match because we've got three films about artists. Uh, which I hadn't even thought about when we picked them. So one thing yeah, we should right. talk about uh, with each film is, does it have anything to say about making art? That's a good point and one I hadn't thought of. Yeah, so the three films are, um, no particular order, uh, we may not do them in this order, but American Fiction, Cord Jefferson's American Fiction, Kelly Reichardt's Showing Up, and Bradley Cooper's Maestro. Um, I've seen the first two twice, and Maestro is the one that I just uh, did some crash course, crash homework, crash homework course, and, and got it in just under the wire yesterday and today. So do you have a preference for order, Stephen? Oh, really? Okay. Uh, well, why don't we start with, and while it's still relatively fresh in my mind, Maestro, Okay. Okay. Uh, which I will say right up front of the three films, it's the one that I didn't think a whole lot of, uh, and I kind of expected that going in. I hope I, did. I hope I hadn't made up my mind already. I try to see things with an open mind, um, but uh, be curious. I don't know anything about your reaction to it. Um, it was up for numerous Academy Awards. I don't think it. I think it got completely shut out. I might be wrong on that. Certainly didn't win any of the major ones. Um, it was another simultaneous, I think, Netflix theater release, or maybe not. I, I could be wrong there. It's definitely available on Netflix now. Um, let me start with what I like, which I can sum up very quickly. I thought the last 20 minutes uh, was pretty good. The way the film dealt with Felicia's cancer which, you know, I don't know what to compare it to in terms of endearment. That's been a common thing for a lot of films. I thought it was handled pretty well. You know, I get that they never said it, but it. I know from Mad Men that at that time, uh, if a, a female was diagnosed with cancer, the husband had to be told before her. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. or simultaneously at the very mm -hmm. least, right? Which is how it happens with Betty and Don Draper. Or sorry, she's with Henry then at the time. Um, so I thought that 20 minutes was pretty good, um, including the scene where he advised the student. I wish there had been more of this in the film on how to handle that technical point of conducting. You know, this is well along into Leonard Bernstein's career. He's, I guess, a guest lecturer or something at a university, and he's doing like a workshop. And the one student conductor is having trouble on this one particular transition and Leonard Bernstein advises him and it's kind of funny because they applaud him and he hams it up as he does often in the film that was pretty well done um that was about it for me Stephen before I go on to the many things I didn't like maybe you would like to talk about if maybe you love the film I don't know I'm handing it over to you I'll, I'll start off like you with uh, some positives knowing that I'm not going to stay there forever. <laughs> so it sounds like we're pretty similar. <clears throat> well, I I liked it uh, as I was watching it. And by the time I wrote about it, which was within 24 hours, I already was saying, okay. you know, on retrospect, I don't know that's that good. Uh, what I liked included, uh, I'm I've just been getting more and more tired of biopics. And I thought this mostly wasn't a biopic, and so I was glad because I will agree with you there. It wasn't a conventional biopic. Yeah. And that's to me, that's a, at this point, that's a good sign. 
Um, I thought the acting was good, and I, I give credit to Bradley Cooper as director for that. Carrie Mulligan, I thought, was the best thing about the movie and in her acting. Uh, the fight scene they have uh, near the end, I guess it is, two-thirds of the way through, mm. was tense in a good yeah. way. Just to make sure I've got the scene right, she's standing to the left of the frame, he's in the right, and she basically, you know, gives it to him, right? Yeah, she reams him pretty good. Yeah. And uh, so I'm running out of things that I liked about it. But again, it matters that while I was watching it, I thought, well, this is all right. You know, uh, I, I just thought about it and I didn't think after the fact, this is not a good movie. I just started thinking uh, what was missing. That's mm -hmm. part of it uh, in terms of uh, the real life stuff that, the part that would have made it more of a biopic, I wondered what was what was missing, and there were a couple of weird artistic choices, uh, the switching back and forth from color to black and white, and the aspect ratio changes. I never really knew why that was happening. I'm sure he had a reason. Maybe maybe it's be. everybody but me knew, but I, I kept. Thinking, why was that? You know, why did he do that? And and if I didn't know, then. It made no impression on me, I guess, is the best you could say for it. I was going to make exactly the same point. And I think the reason he did it was he was, you know, he's an actor directing. And I think he wanted to art it up, you know, he wanted to be a director. He wanted to felt like, well, I'm a director. I need to do stuff like this. I, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. That could be. That could be. <laughs> Not the, you know, uh, people who direct and act in the same at the same time, that's uh, that's not easy. No. It's not that it can't be done. It's not, it's not that it hasn't been done well. Uh, I don't know that that was necessarily wrong. Here. And and again, uh, Carrie Mulligan, she, she's always good. I, I don't want to congratulate Bradley Cooper for that. But, you know, when you've got a good acting performance like that, I, I give a shout out to the director. And, uh, and see, like I say, why he did black and white color, black and white, well, that's just... Uh, it's probably irrelevant in the end. Uh, it's just the sort of thing that after the fact, I thought about it and I thought, well, that was kind of goofy. Why did he bother with that? And uh, instead of thinking, well, that was a good scene or I really learned more about Bernstein. No, it was, why did he do that? And that's not, that's not conducive to thinking highly of the film after the fact. Um, other than the two things I mentioned, I just put most everything else I just found kind of meandering or as with the stuff you were just talking about puzzling. Um, and it wasn't a conventional biopic. And I think that the stuff it was missing would have made it better to be more conventional for me in this case would have been better. <laughs> um, I thought there was very little thought about Bernstein's relationship to his art. I mean, I came out of that not really knowing a lot about how Leonard Bernstein worked. Um, and I do, I, you know, I bought this actually just re like within the past month and a half. It's uh, uh, the Bernstein Century. It's all Aaron Copeland music. And Aaron Copeland turns up in a couple of scenes. And I, I love right. this stuff. Appalachian Spring and Billy the Kid. I came to it through uh, Spike Lee's He Got Game, which he uses mm -hmm. in music in the opening credits, which I mentioned. I just love. Um, you know, and I, in terms of his art, there was this long scene, like 80 minutes in the film, where you got him conducting for a good yes, the famous, four or five the famous minutes. famous conducting scene. Yeah, and I felt like they just kind of put that in as an afterthought. Like someone said, hey, we got to get some actual conducting in here. You know, people are going to expect that. I think for some, and for somebody like me, and this sounds, this is going to sound dumb, but for someone like me who's a real novice about this stuff, I wish there had been a scene explaining what a conductor does. You know, like he, they could have done it. Uh, he's being interviewed by somebody because mm -hmm. I don't know what a conductor does. I don't know why conductors. I know somebody somebody who knows this stuff is laughing at me, rolling their eyes right now, if assuming anybody's watching. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Our mythical viewer is rolling his or her eyes at me right now, but I do not know. Yeah, I see a conductor up there. Is is he or she the number one driving force behind the performance of that music? What does a conductor do? That would have been nice. Um, and then also, and this I think goes to your black and white puzzlement. Uh, 
I thought the film, you know, I always mention this, it's a standard for me, it had no feel for period. And that that chunk of the 50s to me is fascinating. You know, I think mm -hmm. you needed like the pre-Elvis 50s, where I think probably Leonard Bernstein was sitting on top of the world, or, you know, he's got the Philharmonic, he's got on the waterfront, uh, West Side Stories down the road. It didn't have any feel for that, other than maybe that was his idea. Well, we'll just throw in some black and white. Mm -hmm. that'll be that's that's my representation of the 50s um you, you know you had betty was it comden and green a little bit of them um not much not much no, there was name they were name dropping as name much dropping. as anything you're right that was really a name dropping i think you could probably draw an interesting comparison between this film and also another actor directed film for the same time period about an artist you had harris Jackson Pollock film, which, yeah. you know, there's probably a lot of overlap there in terms of both of those people being kind of central to that five-year window. I liked Pollock better. I don't know how well he did on period, but I thought certainly it was better at the artistic end of it. Like he really tried to remember the scenes of Jackson Pollock looking at that canvas and he made an attempt to try and um, capture some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got other stuff here, but let me stop and let you chime in for a bit before I ramble on some more. <laughs> well, in relating to some of the stuff that you said, uh, get the, I don't know if it's the elephant, but the big conducting scene. Uh, I, I too, I read different things. I read people who said that is not how, I, I guess there's actual footage of him conducting that piece at that time. I also wonder, were, I wonder about the He didn't do it right or whatever, you know. Yeah, so, I wonder about that. I don't think that's that was necessary. Um, I honestly thought he. You said it felt like it was just dropped in. I thought this was his Oscar uh, bid. That that's was a, that's four. Yeah. You, um, you know, more power to him. But that's what I thought about it. I thought though that the way the music was uh, treated throughout the movie was kind of odd because it was. It, it, was, it was clear that he was affected by music. And it, and it gave him passion, and that passion was transferred to the audiences. But I thought the passion was really the point, not the music. Uh, I don't, it was like the music was uh, to the side. It was there, but it was there so that we could see how passionate he was, not so that we could appreciate the music. And that that's a decision. I, I can't argue with it, but I just thought, well, Bernstein had to be more than just passionate. The music had to matter. The other thing that seemed uh, oddly uh, sidelined in a way, it's clear his bisexuality is a, is a key part of the narrative of the film. Uh, having said that, uh, there's barely any sex in, in the film. And I don't know, maybe that's to keep the rating down or maybe he didn't think people wanted to see that. I don't it wasn't necessary, but I noticed it. And then i that's when I started thinking, what else wasn't there? Well, uh, he and his wife, uh, Tom Wolf, famously I, wrote I had that their down. Uh, you you scooped yeah. me on that. How could they He's leave radical, that? The radical chic. And uh, it's it's sort of it's sort of like name dropping common and green. It's sort of in there. Oh, he, that, that, he, that, two, that two minute scene was the radical chic move scene. Um, that was it, it mattered no more to them. Okay, that was where he hosted a famous fundraiser for the Black Panthers, correct? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I had that down. How could you possibly leave that out? Obviously, it was a conscious decision to leave it out. It was, I can't believe it was an oversight. Um, and that's just dumb to me because it's a key part. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that we're just supposed to get by osmosis that uh, he had political leanings that were on the right side no i should say left side i guess but uh you know so that we knew he was oh he was a go okay guy you know he, he well they don't, mention, don't put the black panthers too close to the screen there just point out that he was politically minded and did some stuff well and they had the, the student the student conductor was black and yes, we see yes. him uh, uh teaching him but then we see him dancing and you know nuzzling mm -hmm. him disco afterwards so uh, maybe that stood in for black Panthers. <laughs> um anyway that i'll i mentioned one other movie yeah. so you mentioned pollock i hadn't thought of that one but 
that's a good call there. Um, the more obvious one, I think, is tar because it was yeah. quite recent and it was about a conductor. Sure. Uh, uh, and in that case, partly because maybe because it was fiction, so you get a mess with that part. But it was always a character study. This was partly a character study and a little bit of a biopic and a little bit about music. Uh, Tar seemed more impressive to me in retrospect. I can't remember what I thought at the time, but yeah. uh, uh, so the, again, I I, feel, I don't want to badmouth this movie too much because it was okay, and I liked it when I saw it. But I wasn't dying to see it again as soon as I saw it. You know, it was like okay, now I've seen that. Uh, Carrie Mulligan will be in something else, and I'll watch her then. No, I will never see it a second time. I'm um, just let me add some other stuff. So, in terms of the bisexuality or whether he's bisexual or gay, I was looking at a, the Wikipedia thing, and they said that was even in dispute. His daughter said he was both bisexual and gay, which is yeah, yeah. a little weird. <laughs> um, anyway, I thought, like you, I thought it was two things at once. First of all, the topic that they they did deal with it a lot. But that part of it, just the, the look at us, we're dealing with this, seemed kind of behind, like 10 years out of date. But at the same time, it was dealt with very superficial. You know, mm -hmm. it was there a lot. But as you point out, never got really got physical. It was two things at once. It was, to me, out of date and also superficial, if that makes sense. Um, OK, Black Panthers, we talked about. I did stop the film at one point so I could check to see if I was right. Is that Sarah, Sarah Silverman? And indeed it was. Uh, <laughs> yes. Scott you know, and I, yeah, Scott and I were just talking about her uh, a few days ago when we did our School of Rock uh, podcast. Um, Zoomcast. So, and I talked about that. So, last thing I'll say, uh, and then we can move on to films that hopefully we both like. Um, it, it is an example of an increasingly common technique I see in films, biopics, where they finish the film by cutting from the actor or actress to the actual person. And they do it different ways. Uh, Malcolm X, that goes back 20 years. Um, Spike, that goes back more than that, 30 years. Spike Lee cut to the actual Malcolm X. Um, in Nixon, Oliver Stone cut to footage of Nixon's funeral. And I'm not there, Todd Haynes, there's nothing on, it's not uh, visual, it's they cut to the act, Dylan, the actual Dylan singing. I think it was mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Second Side of Memphis. And then in Rocket Man, I checked tonight on YouTube, they cut to stills of old John with little captions. So I just something I notice a lot. And there's one example I was really trying to think of, and I just couldn't, where it, it seemed to be like uh, Exhibit A in this trend. Um, and now this one is co exhibit A because they end by cutting from Bradley Cooper right to a few minutes of the older Leonard Bernstein. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of interesting. Um, I think with the one thing about that trick, if that's what you call it a trick, is the person, the real person, has to have been vital enough to want to make a movie about their life. And so then you've really got to have a powerful. Uh, acting performance of that character. Otherwise, if you go from Bradley Cooper to Leonard Bernstein and Bradley Cooper doesn't uh, level up to Leonard Bernstein, then you've got a problem. And you realize, you put it at the end, you go, well, geez, I thought he was doing a good job, but look at Leonard. You know. So I don't think it happened here, but I think it's a it's a risk in that sense. Um, the, the, the most recent time that I was totally taken with it did they do it in the Elvis film? In yes, the in the Elvis movie, movie when he's singing uh, Unchained Melody at the end, and about halfway through, uh, the actor. Yeah. They, they don't just switch the voice, in they the switch movie. to the actual footage of Elvis. And, and those of us who love Elvis, that's like the last crucial yeah. scene of Elvis singing. He's, he can't do it, but he can. And, he, and it's just it's heartbreaking. And I wasn't expecting it, so here we go. And it comes in, and I thought, well, that worked. Partly, though, it worked because the guy playing Elvis had done such a good job that it wasn't like this big jump from pretend Elvis to real Elvis. It was like guy doing a real good job of being pretend Elvis to the real Elvis kicking it up one more time when no one thought he could. So that was probably the film. I thought it was very good. Probably the one I was thinking of. 
Um, I did love it. I've been, you know, I was, I was really mixed on you know, the Todd Haynes film. I'm not there when I saw it. And I've been meaning to go back to see it because I think there's probably a film there that maybe it just threw me or something. And that's something I, I could like if, uh, you know, hope that I would like it a second time. I did really get like a chill up my spine when he cut to uh, Stuck Inside of Memphis, the actual yeah. building at the end of that. I said, and even I wrote it, even when I wrote about it somewhere, saying I sort of mixed on this film, I said I did love that. It was such a relief to me. And Dylan, just Dylan's voice was so commanding, like coming in and mm -hmm. that. Um, okay, last thing, very last thing I'll say is that I hope I, I hope I don't go into a Bradley Cooper film absolutely unable to like it now because of um, uh, Dave Chappelle's Bradley Cooper jokes on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> the night, the week that Trump lost, I'll never forget it. You know, he's talking about being in the Obama White House, and surrounded by all those black faces. He says, and Bradley Cooper. <laughs> it just it, it makes me laugh to see. Okay, um, that uh, uh, let's go on to American fiction, um, which okay, I um, was, can I yeah. take one marker so we can get to later. Sure. But it, uh, when you mentioned about how I'm not there, and you think you know, I gotta watch that again sometime. Because you weren't sure you liked it and you want to check it again. Yeah. I have, I, there's some movies I just don't like. I, I watched today uh, Goodbye Dragon Inn. God, I hated it. And, and I didn't think you because, should watch it again sometime. I just thought that this uh, this sucks or I thought it sucked. But uh, a Kelly Reichardt, the first movie of hers I saw was Old Joy. Yeah, I know. I, I know because, of, yeah, I know we've talked about that one. And the thing is, is that in thinking about uh, her her work as I've seen it, because I've seen quite a few of her movies now, that does seem like one I should watch again, because I feel like there was something about me and what how I was reacting to the characters, and I might still think it was a bad movie, but I think it deserves another chance. So I'll I'll get back to that when we talk about that movie. But okay, you mentioned yeah. it, I thought it, it, it picked something in my head. I would revisit it. Um, American fiction, I'm happy to say I like because I was really prepared not to like it based on the trailer. Uh, you know, the trailer takes like the most uh, broadest over the top stuff and packs it into 90 seconds. And I'd seen that three or four times. And I went into it thinking, thinking that I'd already seen the film. I said, OK, this is going to be completely over the top. It made me think of Bullworth. Um, and then I actually <laughs> went to Google and I typed in whatever, best satires, most over-the-top mm -hmm. satires, and a couple of things that came up. And I don't know if it's the same thing, but Dr. Strangelove, Network, maybe Wag the Dog. But films that just from start to finish are, you know, unrelenting in the uh, satirical element. And it's not that at all. It really isn't. It is a very measured film um, with a lot of quiet moments. Uh, and the stuff that's in the trailer is really a relatively small part of it. So yeah. that was such a relief to me. I feel like my, I, I may be misquoting her on this, but I feel like my wife was, uh, I might have been the one to pick it. And she said, you know, I'm so glad it wasn't what I thought from the previews. Yeah. I thought it was going to be some stupid comedy, sophomoric yeah. comedy. And she said that wasn't it at all. So she was, she was glad in the same way you were to find out that the preview, whatever they thought they were doing to get people in the theater, it was irrelevant to the actual film. Well, somebody pointed out something interesting in a way that the trailer does really addresses the trailer addresses part of what the film's about, right? Which is sort of taking the most over the top elements of something. And the, the trailer may actually knowingly do that, uh, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and that whole tone is sort of established from that first scene, <laughs> an excellent scene in the classroom. And there are no hysterics. You know, he's got mm -hmm. a word on the board and a student objects to it. And um, he just very calmly, you know, he had the funny line. Uh, I, I'm okay with it. I, I've been dealing, I've dealt with it. I'm sure you can too, Kelly or whatever the name was, the white student in the front. And she just sort of gets up and walks out. It was just a great, great way to start the film. I thought it kind of set the tone for the rest of it. Um, dress the performances. You know, I was probably more mixed on the performances of Maestro than you were, both leads. Um, I can see why you would think a lot of Carrie Mulligan. Uh, 
I thought the performances here were just excellent all around. Um, I'm guessing that you're like me. We're probably sorry to see Tracy Ellis Ross leave the film so soon. She's so good as a sister, you know. Um, I'll just mention now, since it'll affect what I say later, I've read the book. And okay. so I knew that character yeah. wasn't going to make it to the end. Uh, she dies a different way in the book, but yeah, oh. I, I knew she wasn't going to last. So, oh, so I wasn't prepared for that. Um, she's really good. Uh, I thought uh, John Ortiz as the agent was excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I don't even so, know why. I don't even know why he was, uh, why I thought he was so excellent. Like he didn't do anything that extraordinary. Just something about his laid back manner, just sort of taking it all. Combination of I'm acting and I'm natural that he mixes them together and you just want to like him, even if he's not a very good guy. Oh, good. Where do I know him from? I've seen him many times before, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, one famous role. He was in that horse racing uh, show that lasted a year because all the horses were dying. I'm forgetting the name of that one. Didn't see that. Uh, I should have looked up his filmography. Um, Anyway. Eric Alexander as his, uh, you know, sometime girlfriend. Who I yeah. guess she was in the Cosby show. I used to watch the Cosby show. I don't remember her in that. I feel like she's not in uh she's not around often enough. Yeah, she would have been much younger. Um Sterling K. Brown, who I thought was really good as a brother. I've seen some criticism that he played at, you know, too much of a we're gonna stick this really contemporary character in. We're gonna make the the brother gay, but we're gonna make him very um uncliche gay and you know, he's gunning for an Academy Award and all that. I thought he was really good. Uh, and it was yeah. nice seeing somebody I hadn't thought about in years. I posted about her on the, there's a thread on the message board about, like, I had no idea this person was still alive. It was Leslie Uggams, who yeah. I, it was a kind of a thing when I was younger, you know. I knew her. I knew her before I was 10. She was just around. I mean, she. I think she was a bit of a singer, but I looked at her. She was singing along with Mitch. Yeah, she, she maybe, was. You know, that was a big show in my household when I was a kid. So yeah. maybe it's the beginning of where I knew her. My parents had an album or two around. She was on TV. She was just one of those mm-hmm. people around, and I hadn't thought about her for years. And I don't don't even think I picked up on right away that it was her. Um, throw something out at you here. See what you think. I think there is sort of. That Wright's character is somewhat comparable to Paul Giamatti in The Holdovers, but I think Jeffrey Wright's character, Monk, um, is just much more dimensional. Like, you know, Giamatti just plays the curmudgeon to a hill. It's not very nuanced, I don't think. And I thought Jeffrey Wright does a similar character, similar in some ways, much better, you know? Sort of a bulwark against standards and... Um, you know, that scene, that opening scene in the classroom, that could have been Giamatti in some ways. You know, uh, maybe you said it right there because uh, his character in American fiction is a bulwark. He, he's, 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 his version of standards, I believe in him in a way where I didn't resent that he believed in standards. I love Paul Giamatti. I thought he was fine in Holdovers, but he just I didn't like that movie mm. because... I don't like what he was sticking up for. Even as yeah. you say, yeah, he was sticking up for the standard way. But uh, I thought, you know, if I was his student, I'd be the guy who sat in the back and threw spit was and, and <laughs> didn't like what he was saying. I didn't f- ever feel that way. I thought that, uh, you know, Jeffy Wright's character, uh, I bought it. It may have helped that I I knew the character from the book, but nonetheless. Uh, yeah, you would yeah, have he, been different. Yeah, yeah, he won me over if I hadn't already been one over. Um. Jeffrey Wright, you know, I didn't like him in those recent... I've seen a lot of his films. I liked him a lot as Bosque a number of years ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did, did not like him. I'm not even blaming him in these <laughs> dumb Wes Anderson films he gets stuck in. Not stuck in. He takes roles, but uh, you know, I just don't like him in those. I don't like anybody in those films. I'm not I'm not a fan of him, so of Wes Anderson, so yeah, I hear so you. I think he was very good in this. Um now, here's something, a point where I was actually confused. Um, like, i not confused. I just read it a different way and then found I was completely wrong. When he sits down to write my pathology, um, I thought it, initially it was totally a financial decision that he realized he had to pay for his mom going into this expensive long-term care facility. And I was surprised when, you know, he did it just as kind of a malicious joke. 
he had no intention of it being accepted. And when uh, his agent contacts him to say, gleefully, they've, they bought the book, he's taken aback and he blocks yeah. it first. He doesn't want that. I thought that he did went into that knowingly said, okay, I'm going to cash in. And I'm going to, so that was sort of interesting to me that I read that, read his motives completely wrong. I love the scene uh, where, um, you know, a little gimmicky, I'll admit, but where he's sitting there writing out, typing up his novel, and it's visualized with the two yes. actors. A second that the way that the way they did that, and at first he's <laughs> no quite what's going on, and then they would stop and they would say, "Is that how you want me to read it?" I, would, I, I put thought, I love I when they would directly addressed yeah. him, and that yeah. is the kind of thing you know I complained about uh, Maestro not really ever addressing. I'm not saying it's brilliant or anything, but it is a way to address the artistic process. You know, yeah. and because nothing nothing's more boring than just watching somebody write on screen. Yeah, but you do it like that, and then you you're still getting the sense of them writing, and you get a sense of what they're thinking about as they write. And uh, I thought yeah, I was very impressed by that scene. Thought it worked well. Um, now, something you have to accept is that he could sit down and write that novel so quickly. <laughs> I mean, it seemed to be a couple of days pass between him, him at the typewriter and the agent saying, "Oh, they took the book." Even if the even if he writes the book out of you know, uh, sarcastic malice. I think he would probably take maybe more than three days to write it. I don't know how long it was, but uh, that's fine. I, I didn't didn't impact however, whatever I thought about the film. Um, now, the two broadest characters, again, I was prepared for this complete over-the-top satire. The two broadest characters, and thankfully they're both kind of small roles, are, thankfully for me anyway, are the uh, publisher's PR guy who sits, you know, to her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. who is flamboyantly gay. And when I went on to the message board and said, you know, if you're gay, how do you feel about this? And someone pointed out, that's a gay actor. Um, you know, you're giving visibility. That's maybe the way he is in real life. I don't know, whatever. And I said, okay, that's fine. And the other one is the female judge for the literary prize. She's a little bit too, you know, whatever. She's the left, you know, bleeding heart left person on the left and she's a little cliche but she does have my favorite line in the film we'll yeah. talk about i want to talk about the conversation that um monk has with uh want to get her name right Sintara, which i thought was excellent anyway after they have their heart to heart she comes in <laughs> plops herself down she says so what are we talking about <laughs> it actually made me laugh out loud they just and and um the, uh, the director was wise enough to just cut right after, like, well, they've just been talking about the most important thing in the world and, you know, what this whole film's about. <laughs> now you can chime in on that. Um, and the third character, which uh, this might surprise you, it's a little bit of a stock character, is the um, homemaker, the good-hearted homemaker. Lorraine. Whose goodness is so, you know, completely perfect that mm -hmm. that a little bit of it. She's not, it's not hard to watch. You like the character. It's just, you know, that's a bit of a throwback. Um, go ahead. I've rambled on a lot. Tell me some more. I have more notes. So uh, I think Stephen will do that. We probably will have to come back for a second one because we've got five, about five minutes to talk more about this. And I've got more things to say. So you take over for that. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll hit the book for a bit here. Yeah. Uh, Issa Ray, who's a, I'm a fan of hers and she plays the author, uh, we lives in the ghetto, that author. Uh, I like the way that she was presented in the movie. In the book, uh, she is a stereotypical character. And I thought that the movie gave her some substance. They, they, when she talked about what she was doing and why she was doing it, I thought, thought it was better than just uh, people are stupid and I'm writing for them. So I thought I liked the way that was that was drawn out. Uh, the housekeeper, uh, um, again, this is my interpretation, but yeah, for me, in the book, the housekeeper doesn't much like him, and their relationship isn't very good, and she's always kind of... Uh, so the, the, the way that it happened in the movie where where they got on better, it made her seem like a nicer person, and uh, I think it worked as far as that went as well. Yeah, she was fine. Finally, let me check here. Oh, this is, which relates to that book he wrote. 
this is where I thought the movie really improved. In the book, he writes that my pathology, the entire book is in the book. Okay. Oh, I mean, really? here and there. I mean, I, I can't, I don't think it's a whole chunk. I think it's a chunk and a chunk and a chunk. But anyway, the whole book is in the book. And the thing is, he's so good <laughs> at writing that it's the it's a perfect version of that book, which means it stinks. <laughs> but you're reading it. So it's like, oh man, after a while, I'm like, is he gonna do the whole book? This really sucks. Yeah. And the point of it was that it sucked. I not understood that, but I had to read it. So in the movie, where all we got was that scene with the actors, I said, Oh, this is great. That and, was more than enough. Yeah. Yeah, more power to him that he could he could write that fake book. And I understand why he put it in there, but it was kind of like reading Moby Dick and wanting to skip the whale chapters because what do you care about the sperm? You know, it's just like, okay, we know what the book's like. He gave us the first chapter. That's good enough. Whatever. Yeah, that's a great decision to leave that out. Um, let me mention, we got three minutes left. Uh, I got to uh, mention how much uh, Lisa's Roe versus Wade joke. <laughs> I don't know if that Roe v. Wade joke, I don't know if that's a novel. That was pretty like corny, great. Yes. Um, the uh, ending, you know, I hate using cliches, but the meta ending, um, it reminded me of Altman's The Player, the, the way it ended with the film within the film, especially mm -hmm. the third option, which was like the player exactly, right? And it was funny. I liked it. <laughs> and I liked the guy that was the Hollywood guy. Like he was, mm -hmm. no, you know, he was an idiot, but he was also, he knew exactly what he wanted. And he... He didn't, you know, he didn't suck up to Monk. He was just, he knew exactly what he wanted. He was a likable character. Um, and I, I do have to, again, go back to that conversation, long extended conversation with Monk and uh, Centara. I thought it was great. First of all, because it brought up the question that I'm sitting there, I want to ask, like when, when, uh, um, oh, what was it? He was, sh oh, shocked that, Oh, I forget how it's set up, but he wanted to say, oh, he would, when he found out that she hated my pathology, I immediately mm -hmm. wanted to say the same thing he did. But how is that different from what you do? And that's what the scene's about. And what mm -hmm. I liked about it, secondly, her explanation was credible. It was perfectly credible. Yes, that's why I say and, that, uh, they gave her that opportunity in the and, movie to explain what she did. And his objections to her explanation, they were credible, yes. too. Yes. They were both, every everything each of them said made perfect sense. And the scene yeah. wasn't resolved. It just ended with the woman coming in saying, so what are we talking about? I thought it was a perfect scene. And, uh, it, you know, the central issue of the film. And then you end up, you know, got the interesting last shot where he looks over at the extra on the lot. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot to say there. Uh, anyways, it just it was a really successful film. There wasn't Hardly anything I change in it. Um, I'll, I'll toss out one last thing, which yeah, is awesome. a, a sign of maybe of its uh, success as well. I'm reading Percival Leverett's newest novel, partly because it sounds interesting, but yeah. also because I got him in my brain because I read the book and I saw this movie. And then I heard, oh, you've got another book. And I said, I got to read that. It's uh, it's called James and it's the story of Huck Finn, but oh. from the Jim's one who writes it. Oh, interesting. Narrates it and everything else. So it's, um, it's, uh, one it's, and this is Cord Jefferson's first film, so it's a very impressive debut. Mm -hmm. Okay, Stephen, let's come back. Uh, might be 10 minutes. I don't know. And we'll talk about Kelly Reichert showing up. Can okay. you be okay with I'll that? Yep. Okay. See you in a bit.